Um, so, uh, what I um, inspired by this this whole event, like I mentioned yesterday when uh, when I spoke with you, was that it gives me the opportunity to re to say things, reflect on things that I don't normally have the opportunity to do, and in a way express more myself than my work. So I'm going to take my molecular biologist academic hat off. I'm going to put my just fellow human being hat on and try to give you a very personal view of the area of work, the field of science that I work in. And to really, this is a little bit difficult, but what I, what I perceive, what I have perceived happened in science over the years since I entered it, which is really the, the demise of science. The, as Robert Schuller mentioned before, the, the broken nature of the system that I find myself working within right now. But being in this, and being within, within with you all this weekend, has given me actually great hope for the future because I, like Robert before me, I believe I'm in the presence of people who could be the healers of the broken system. So I'll just give you, uh, you know, my, uh, in a bit my history and we'll see why, we, that, you know, we can arrive at a very hopeful future. I wanted to become a scientist from the day that I found out that science existed. It was always a question of what area, whether I'd be a, a physicist, an astronomer, or whatever. I never wanted to be a biologist, though. I saw that as a soft science, and I used to tease my, my classmates uh, in secondary school who were doing biology, and I said, ah, soft science, you stick with that. We in chemistry, physics, you know, we're doing the real hard stuff. But, it, and, but as ke and chemistry came extremely easy to me, so I went, up to, I went up to Oxford to read chemistry. But within a couple of months, I kind of saw the light and I switched to biochemistry. So I found myself in the biological discipline that I was dismissing before. And that was to, uh, to good effect, because through the biochemistry, I ended up becoming interested in genetics and molecular biology, and then I went on to do PhD in a molecular biology area. And, and specializing in the areas that brings me to where I am today. But I remember as a young, you know, when I was in school, the way, what was the, why was I so inspired to become a scientist? I saw it as entering into an area that was there really to serve for the public good. And I saw it as science working as a, as a, as a community, free communication, uh, people sharing, knowledge and ideas. Yes, there's always competition there, you know, people like to be the first to do this, that or the other. But nevertheless, was a, there was a good spirit, there was a camaraderie and a spirit that I found in, in my early years as, a, as an undergraduate and graduate and, and my early years as a postdoc. But what has happened in more recent years, say from the 80s onwards, what I have found uh, is that th this is all of what I've just been saying has become eroded. What has happened is we have seen the, uh, uh, and I'm talking about the life sciences here, of course, my own area. I have seen the overt commercialization of my, my area. Now, not that that's necessarily bad. I admit straight away that I have had many collaborations with industry partners. Uh, I've done some of my best work with industry and I have industrial collaborators now. And if that is with, I feel, with mutual respect and, and things are done responsibly, then you can produce valuable products uh, cl for clinical, clinical use. But uh, things, don't, uh, and I should say as well that I'm, I'm, I'm an inventor on patents as well. So, uh, 
and I have even a little bit of income from one of them, which you know I feel I deserve, you could say. <laughs> it, unfortunately, it's not enough to retire on, but it makes, makes a little bit of a difference in my life. But what we're f finding, however, is, is that industry influence in academia is now all pervasive, especially here in the United States, where money is pouring in from industry into academia. They're building whole institutions, as Robert will tell you, has happened at Cornell, and what has happened, say, here at Berkeley in the Bay Area. And as a result of that, academia has become incredibly dependent on massive amounts of income from industry. Again, that isn't necessarily bad if the intentions are good, but unfortunately, what is happening, the way I perceive it, is that industry starts to dictate what goes on and, and puts constraints, therefore, on what academics do and can say. And therefore, a scientist who does work that casts, say, an industry product in a bad light can face major obstacles, reprimands, and even be squeezed out of their position. And I know more than one person that has suffered these kinds of outcomes. Just to give you an example from my own experience along those lines. Some few years ago, there was a... Um, uh, the Bill, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gave six and a half million pounds to an institution, a GM crop in, a development institution in the UK, to develop nitrogen fixing crops. And I was called by a journalist, uh, but nitrogen fixing cereals, nitrogen fixing cereals. I was called by a journalist at one of the national daily newspapers to pass comment on this. And I said, well, I think they're wasting their money because we already know how to fix nitrogen very efficiently through crop rotation and so I said that I felt that the Gateses had been misled and that their money was better spent elsewhere. A tiny little piece appeared in the newspaper with a few lines of a couple of sentences of quotes from me. Quotes from me. Two days later I was called into my head of department's office to tell me that there had been complaints. Or, well, two things happened actually. First of all the institute that had received the money called kings and complained about me. Like I had support, however, I said to them, I felt perfectly qualified to comment on this because it was a transgenic, I'm a transgenic expert, I can pass comment on transgenic technology. It's, and they said, fine, great, we'll, we'll deal with that for you, that's fine. But a couple of days later, my head of department called me into their office and they said there had been complaints from other academics within kings without telling me who they were and that they thought that um, I shouldn't be saying the things that I was being critical of the Gates Foundation. And I don't know if you're aware, but the Gates has become a major contributor to academic research for all kinds of different things, including GMOs. And so they were afraid that me being critical of Gates could stifle funding from the Gates Foundation, basically. And I said, well, I, I, but I was expressing a personal view. I was told, however, in no uncertain terms that in my engagement with the media on GMOs, I should not mention my affiliation with Kings, as if nobody can find out my affiliation within five seconds flat, of course, by getting their mobile phone out and seeing where I'm based. But nevertheless, that was the case. And this repeated itself as well. And this, uh, and this only because I was being critical. There was a time when I was quoted with an, I was being, uh, when Professor Serenini published this study on, uh, negative effects from GMOs and Roundup in September 2012, I came out and supported the study. Another member of King's was coming out and being critical of the same study. We were being quoted in the same article, him being critical and I'm being supportive. I was the one that got the reprimand. I was called back into my head of the department's office and said, no, you must not do this. So these are the double standards that are there, but don't feel sorry for me. I got a, you know, what I experienced was light, very light. Other academics like Jeffrey before me have lost their jobs because of being critical of, of GMOs and industry practices of this type. So this is where, what we're finding now is that basically I feel that because of the overt infiltration, we we'll call it that, uh, uh, of, of industry influence within academia, I find, 
I find that what's happening is it's stifling science. You have to toe a very narrow conventional line, and, and this is in getting your grants as well, and, and it's stifling creativity. And I feel as a result, you know, because basically academia has sold out to industry influence, and what we're finding is it has lost its conscience. This is a demise that I feel that at least my sector of academia, the life sciences, have the demise it's found itself. It's lost its conscience. And it would do things for, for commercial reasons rather than for really trying to help uh, society as a whole. If I need now, and it's stifled collaborations. If I need a product now, if, I, if somebody has produced something that I want and I write to them, they will not give it to me unless I sign a material transfer agreement. Basically, almost like a, 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 a prenuptial commercial agreement. That if I do something with their product that advances it, they still claim ownership of that product. This is this, and, I've, and, and, and it comes to the point where I don't sign these. I say to hell, I'll make my own because I know how to do it. It's just take me a little bit longer to get to where I want to be. So this is the, the very mixed situation we find ourselves in, in, in the life sciences for me. And I find it very, very sad. The, the, you know, the academia, the university environment that I entered in all enthusiastically has become, it just doesn't exist anymore on, on the whole. There, there are still there. I have wonderful collaborators, people that still, there are some there with the conscience. And they're the ones that are great to work with. And I'm lucky to, to be able to do that. But on the whole, I feel it has, science has lost its conscience. So I say to you, and I've met a number of you from yesterday that are aspiring to go to university to do science. And I say to you, go for it. But please, because it needs people, what we need is a new wave. I feel a new wave, a new generation of scientists that are gonna come in and bring the conscience back into science the conscience where we are working for the collective good and not for some narrow, selfish, self-serving aspiration, commercial aspiration. This is what we need, and I hope that some of you will pick up on that challenge and, um, and, 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 and transform it, because the way things are right now, for me, they are, to use the term that we use in, generally in the environment movement, things are unsustainable in the way they are right now in science. It is unsustainable. Vast amounts of money are being poured in with very little coming out that is of really positive value to society. So I say to you, please come along and join us in this aspiration. And uh, if I can be of any help, let me know. Thank you very much.